Lou Roselli, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited. Been a been a fan from for many years from afar, and you know, I was looking through your your career, and man, you've touched on so many different eras and so many guys. Let's just go back though to the first time you got the call to interview for the OU job. How did that come about? Well, I was in uh, Rio with Kyle Snyder at the time, and so when they called me, you know, it was uh, you know I was obviously out of the country. Uh, um, spoke with uh, Joe Castiglione, I spoke with Jason Leonard, you know, and um, you know when I got back, then then we actually got it. It, it came a little bit more real, you know. Obviously, I was there to, to help Kyle Snyder. It's always um, it's always nice when people approach you, you know. Um, this was a was a place where I I knew that if you get all the things in place that you need to have, that uh, you can be successful. So you're at the Olympics with Snyder, you get a voicemail and then you end up contacting the OU guys when you get back. And that's what started that process. Yeah. I, I spoke to them over, you know, when I was in Rio too, I, I spoke to them on the phone on uh, one or two occasions. And I can't remember. It's been a long time um, Yeah, on one or two occasions. And then came back, we set up an interview. I flew in and then, uh, you know, it's funny because when you're on the East coast and, um, and, you know, obviously I'm, I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. You know, and and in Norman, if you'd have told me three years prior to Rio that you'd be in Norman, I would have been like, well, I don't know, man. You know, I'm from <laughs> New York. You know that, right? But um, when you come in and you see everything, you know, from facilities to nutrition to academic services and, you know, um, you just go, hey, that it's a place and the tradition, it, it's a place where you can win. And what did you think you would have ended up after being at 10 years at Ohio State? Did you just plan on staying there for, for quite some time or did you have any plans for the East Coast? No, you know, I really didn't know. You know, I I really enjoyed my job at Ohio State. You know, I I you know I had a lot of opportunities to, to you know between working with lightweights, working with the Olympic program, working. Tom Ryan let me do a lot of things. I'm you know um, I had a lot of paperwork stuff that I did as well. People don't know that about me. It's like no, no, I had other duties. Guys, it wasn't just coaching Logan, Steber, and Kyle, and and then uh, go home and take a nappy. You know, so it was you know <laughs> good. It, it, I didn't really have any set place. You know, I, I knew eventually I want to be the head coach somewhere, but um, so I mean, it was you know, um, n- nothing really planned, and so this came about, and obviously with with what OU has, it was it, it's an exciting opportunity, and uh, it's been a, it, it's a good challenge, and and um, uh, and I'm glad it, it's going in the direction it is. Yeah, no, I mean, Big Twelve champs last year, second or you know, two years ago, then second last year, and definitely building with a lot of the recruiting that you've been doing. Let's go back to the 2016 Olympics. So I kind of forgot that you were in, you know, with Snyder there. What was that like watching him win his first gold? Well, you know, I, I've been with him and he won the world's night, uh, you know, the year prior, you know, and, and 15 and, and then and we won the nationals in 15 too. So and then in 16, you know, being with him to win the Olympic gold too. So it, it really was, it's exciting. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough and God's given me enough opportunities to, to, to be in some corners and be a part of a lot of things. And, and, um, I don't take that for granted, you know, being a part of, you know, being in the, in the Olympic finals, being in the world championship finals, being, you know, having guys win the U S open, you know, having them win the world team trials and the Olympic trials. It's, it's, it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun when you're at that level. Yeah. I mean, think about the guys you got to work with, you know, starting with Jay Jaggers and then, the great Logan Stever and, you know, all those guys that came through that, though, that, that Ohio state room, as well as the RTC room, man. And you look at Snyder, he's still doing it, man. He looked great this weekend. Well, he's a young man. He's a young man. <laughs> hey, eight years old, you know, it's things are, you know, it's not like a lot of times, you know, um, started getting into their stride at 26, 27, you know? And so, when you're 18 and you're dominating and you're and you're winning world titles at that age, you know, I mean, he's got eight eight medals or so now. Still there? Yep, I am. Yeah, cool. I am. Cut out just a little Audio bit. Audio go. Yeah, just, but I, I heard most of it though. Um, so you, but you you look back at when you were wrestling, you know, on the, on the world level in the nineties versus now, there's a lot of differences, one, the funding. Um, but what do you think explains the difference in success? Is it the funding or is it like that we're doing so much freestyle at a younger age because of the RTCs? Like what are some of the key differences that allow these guys to go out there so young? 
well, well, the funding certainly matters, but, but the, the RTCs give um, the ability to the young people to get world-class coaching. You know, if you come into our RTC and you're learning how to gut wrench properly and lace and you understand the zone and you understand uh, transitions and, you know, um, you understand head position. And there's just so many things that you'll learn at an earlier age when you, when you get to be a part of a, a very good RTC. And when you're a part of that, you know, you start growing exponentially and these kids start winning medals that, you know, uh, you know, look at the cadets, look at the juniors, you know, look at U23s that were, they're successful all the way around. And um, so people are winning at an earlier age because of the RTCs, but you, but you definitely got to have funding, right? Yeah. You still got to have funding. And, and now you got this image and likeness that's changing the game too. So that there's a lot of uh, reasons that to go out and get more resources. And so when you were, when you were competing, you were on the Olympic team in 96, but in the, you know, in the mix U S open champ 95, uh, I believe 98 as well. Um, but you know, back then, what was the funding like for you and your teammates? I mean, what was, what was that like? Was there, was there nothing or was there a little bit of something? There's a little bit here. I'll give you a perspective because maybe, maybe, you know, that this would probably be interesting for people. No, when I wrestled, you probably got 800 to a thousand bucks a month tops, you know, um, when I was at Ohio State, you might have gotten $2,500 to $3,000 tops. Now you can probably get ten dollars to $12,000 a month tops. If you're a world-class athlete and you're, you know, Kyle Snyder, you're in a different, on a different platform. You might have a different, those are, those are different numbers, right? I mean, to have somebody, you know, that, that's on a national thing, that's running for it, you know, uh, it's probably cost you five thousand five or six thousand dollars to have he might not even make the team might be top three so the numbers have changed a ton from the 800 bucks a month that i made to what somebody at penn state might make. and how do you see the the rtc's in the role of your program well it's just it's 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 a huge component if you got to have it to be successful there's no there's no other way to win the model is set guys and now like i said it's going to have another flavor another um, to it with this image and likeness, but you're going to have, you know, you're still going to have to have Olympic guys training with your guys for culture and recruiting. And then obviously you got this image and likeness where you can go out and, and uh, you know, it's not pay to play, but you know, you can go out and get, you know, uh, a few more people with, with image and likeness money. So yeah. I think both 501c3 is, is are going to be, you know, they're going to be important and, and the resources will matter. It will not be as pure as it used to be. It, it there will be more, you know, they, Got to have the resources. Got to have them. And I know people always want to just go to the coach and, and say, well, coach them better. Well, sometimes you got, you got to start with a certain pedigree. You know, they got to have, you know, he came that way. So how I say it sometimes, he just came that way. Listen, Logan Stieber, we made him really good. But he, but I can tell you this, he came that way. He was already, a, a, he already knew how to win stuff. That's why he was a, like 190 and one, you know. <laughs> Taylor, Snyder never lost. You know, uh, you go through some of it and you go, oh, I see why. <laughs> so they were good. And I, I'd like to think that we continue to make them better when we were there. That's part of, that was part of the plan is to constantly make those guys grow. And when they're that, really that good, you better have a really good wrestling IQ to make them grow, you know? And so your job is to make them better than they already are. And, um, and that was always my plan and, and my goal, no matter where I coach, it's like, no, my job is to make them better. Yeah. If I can be better and I understand it and I put time and energy into them, they will be better if, if they can just hold up and do, and do the work. And when you when you guys were recruiting Logan Stever, that had to be one of the most high profile recruits of that two thousands era. You know, the whole decade. What was it like the day you got the, you guys found out you were gonna you landed him and signed him? You know, Logan Stever, I'll tell you. You know, some of it, some of it's just a little bit of luck. Logan Stever was born to be a Buckeye. You know, I hate to say that. You know, he and there was a time when they could come on campus and go to the football games at a very early age. And you know, there's a hundred and five thousand people in the stadium. There's another fifty thousand outside of it, and so. Um, and we're, we're starting to put a team together that was really good with Tate Dagger. Kind of started that, started that, uh, series off. And, um, once they realized he could win there, I don't think there was any other place he'd ra rather go if you ask him, you know. And so it was, it, but it's always good when you get somebody of that caliber come into your program, you know, not, not everybody, you know, has that, you know, has that type of pedigree. And, and what was it with him? Was it his obviously tremendous technical background, had worked at it forever? But what was uh what was that unique thing that he did really well? Well, Logan was good in so many areas, but I think the one thing I would tell people, you know, um, <clears throat> he had a couple setbacks early on, and then his ability to just say, just tell me what to do, I'll do it, whatever I got to do, I'll do it. And um, and so some people think it's his skill sets. I like, know he's a shooter, he's a great shooter, he's an incredible top wrestler, you know. 
But I think his willingness to listen and be coachable and learn and 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 do the work made him great. He was already going to be pretty good, guys. Let's not let's not take anything away from who he is. That would be a you know that that would be that wouldn't be right. <laughs> but but I think the willingness to just to suffer and and we had a lot of two days together. You know my my time there. We spent a lot of time together. And um, really, you know, it's like morning workouts together or what? Always, always. I probably for six years. You know, I, I bet you four and a half of those years, four to four and a half of those years, he spent morning and afternoons with me. You know, I'd put him to his lifts, running. We'd run and lift weights on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and on Tuesday, Thursday, we I called the drills and skills and some conditioning, and then the afternoon he did afternoon practice. So yeah, we spent a lot of time together. Every every interview I listen to you, coach, you mentioned two a days. Where, where did you first uh, get this? Get get now, I mean, not this concept, but why is it so important to you? Well, I just think there's just a, a, you know, I think I do believe you know maybe it's just philosophically that's you know um, the ten thousand hour rule does apply, you know, and and maybe for David Taylor it's seven seven thousand, but for most of us it's ten thousand. You know, us <laughs> average people grind and, and do the do the extra. We got to do what we got to do. You know, maybe we didn't have as much gifts, so I, I, it's just my philosophy on things. And, and I've seen a lot of people win, you know, doing, doing their time, you know, and, and sometimes it's not right away, but, but at the, at the same time, if they're persistent and they stay consistent to what they believe and they do, they continue to do it. They, a lot of them have the ability, you know, and they have the talent. So when, when you apply that talent, it just, it just shows up and time and energy that they, they put into it. So it's, um, you know, for me, that's just kind of, I've watched a lot of people win like that. And I know there's probably other philosophies and other people that, you know, can, can get around it, you know, but, but if you're not as gifted and you don't have the, you know, the same tools, you know, I would tell people, listen, you have to put more time and energy into it. You know, it's not going to just happen, you know, and some people might say, no, they swear by something else. And, and I'll tell you, you know, and that might work for him, but sometimes it's an outlier. You're an outlier compared to the rest. You, you, you might be a little bit different, but in general, most of us, live a life of two a days that, that make it work, you know? And so, you know, and, and if it's not two a days, then you better have some pretty damn good partners that, that you're competing with at a high level all the time. And so, plus the mental edge of doing two a days alone is, is there's something to be said for that? No, for sure. When, when you know that you, you, you lose, you lose your fear in those days, right? You, you, you lose fear when you put enough time and energy into something, you know, you, you, you don't have that anxiety. You know, you've done everything possible. So I, I think that you, you lose that and then, you know, it's a component that you can compete freely, you know, and if you can go out and compete freely because you know you've done every single thing there is, that, you know, there's no shortcuts in there. And um, and when people, um, you live like that, it gets it gets much easier than, than if knowing that you took some shortcuts along the way, whether you didn't make weight correctly, you didn't, you know, you, you missed a few things. Um, and there's times to taper. Don't get me wrong. We're not doing two days when we're getting ready for a competition on those high profile things. You know, uh, I'm a systems guy, but in general, you know, Logan Steve on a Sunday would wrestle for 50 seconds, 50 seconds. And a lot of times, you know, wrestle something good, pin him in 50 seconds. So it's like he, he didn't work today, guys. He made weight, wrestled 50 seconds. His days off might look different your day off. You know, he so might that's have an training off day for him. One, at least one, one practice on, on off days for him. Sometimes, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow didn't even do anything you know so i mean but he when you're as good as him on top yeah i'd say he, he you know you're pinning guys that are ranked fifth sixth in the country and um you know he might have to do do extra because of it <laughs> but, but so game, you can game uh, day was easy you can attest that logan stever did two a days for the majority of his college career if not all of it like 99 percent of the time i agree yes Yes, I've seen him a, a lot, you know, do, do time. He did his time. He did his time for sure. And when you look at the strength and conditioning part of it, you guys said you did strength and conditioning Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And this isn't even specific to Logan, but what, what do you believe is, is a good mix of like how you structure that strength and conditioning workout? Is it sprints? Is it kettlebells? Like, what, what are you a fan of? Well, it just depends. You know, everybody has their own system. And weightlifting can be, as you know, some people, you know, Kyle Snyder, just straight up lifting. You know, um, you know, um, Logan was probably a tweener. So, you know, he had that his he had to balance his weight loss and what he weighed to how much he lifted. So I think I just think it's individual. You have to just especially if you're doing things one on one with people or, or with only a couple people, you can kind of manage that. 
You know, if you got a big, you got 30 guys, you can't manage. Everyone's kind of doing the strength program. Right. <laughs> um, so it just depends. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I always felt like running for 15 minutes, got them hot. And then, uh, then we could lift some weights and it was a good balance for him, you know, and it worked well because, you know, he'd get hot and sweaty and then we'd lift weights and push himself and, you know, and, and he'd get a good workout in, then we'd come back in the afternoon. And so I just think you're just going to have to probably manage that by who you have and, and what they're capable of and what, what their needs really are. Yeah. And I remember just hearing other interviews you've done with, with regards to the systems, like when you were at Edinburgh, it was, it was quite a bit different because you didn't have necessarily the resources to do one-on-ones. So what was like some of the biggest changes you saw coming from Edinburgh to Ohio State on the recruiting trail? Well, I think, you know, here's one of the bigger ones. Obviously, Ohio State's a huge brand. And um, once we had it up and running, and you know, the difference is this, you know, you, you probably can make a couple of phone calls, have them on campus, and, and we can get, a, get them signed, <laughs> get them bought into what we're doing. Um, Edinburgh might be a little little bit more challenging, you know. You know, you're looking for different – there are just differences, too, in, in who you're going after. You know, you know, at Edinburgh, maybe we were going after, listen, I'd, I'd like the champ, but if, but if he took second or third, you knew he was good and you watched him do the wrestle backs and he was tough that, you know, and it can hold up to what we do. It was, a, um, you know, that was a win-win, you know, like, and so when I, I think when it comes to recruiting, it was just, they're just looking at, you know, you're looking at an apple in a race car, you know, they're just two different things, you yeah. know, where we we're going, you know, in Ohio state. You know, right away, we're like, let's go after – we went after the best kids in the country right away, and then we went after the best kids overall. And uh, guys that were – we were looking at that wanted to be Olympians, you know, especially once our Olympic program was up and running the right way. Um, we knew it was a one-stop shop of being able to get a great education, win the national title, train for the Olympics afterwards, have the opportunities to give them. At, at Edinburgh, we just didn't have those type of resources to and funding to be able to give them that opportunity, you know. Yeah. And – and, guys don't didn't want to be olympians you know <laughs> not everybody wants to be one i get that but um you know that's what we when i was at ohio state that's what we hunted for that's what i look for here people that want to wrestle at the next level yeah man that's that's exciting i mean i can only imagine how exciting it must have been back in you know spring uh, like it was like was it 06 or 09 when did you guys all get there 06 06 yeah 2006 man, that must have been uh some energy and then you know, in, in no time, you guys really turned it around and, you know, second 08 or in second and 09 and then won it in 2015. Um, you know, what, what what did you pick up from Tom Ryan working with him over the years? You know, li- listen, Tom, Tom has an incredible skill set, you know, and he has a he's really good at, at bringing people into the program and making sure that having fans and ticketing. And he, he loves that that part of that CEO part of that. You know, we were a really good combo because of that. Cause I like the wrestling portion. I, I, you know, I like the X and the nose. I didn't mind being at practice twice a day. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know, and it's not that he didn't enjoy practice. It's just that, you know, he liked some of those other things and, and together, you know, I think our, it was a good combo at times because he had, some, he had some things he didn't really care that much. About. I had things that I probably were like, eh, you go, <laughs> you handle that. I'm cool. <laughs> you know, that part of it, you know, was, was always good, you know, and, and I think he's all, he always pushed for his assistant coaches to, to, to do better with their, you know, their salaries. And as long as you were delivering, he, he took good care of it. So, but, but there was just things that he was really good at when it comes to marketing, marketing and, and, uh, and ticketing, you know, that that's hard to do to get people to buy into that, you know? And so, you know, like I said, we were, we we're, we we're a good combo when, it, when we were together for sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, you know, when you have the brain of like Ohio State or certainly Oklahoma, you know, there's there's a lot of potential there. Sometimes it just needs to be massaged a little bit. And, and now that you're at Oklahoma, um, you know, you're six, seven years into the into the role now. What's it been like for you trying to kind of learn some of the not learn, but, you know, d- develop some of those those uh, CEO like skills along with what you've been doing in the room for you know for better part 20 years? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, I think there's just more challenges. You know, I think that, you know, it, it doesn't come naturally for me. You know, um, but but at the same time, I recognize the things that, you know, the things that I need to have handled, you know, um, being able to, to, to market it better, being able to get more people in the seats, being able to do more socials. Um, and, you know, that's part of it. But, you know, you got to get enough good kids to have a really good product, too. So yeah. there's, a you know, and you got to have the resources to build this Olympic program that, you know, and make sure that you have money for image and likeness and, and things there, you know, there to raise enough resources to do the things that you got to do. And um, so I think there's just balance, you know, um, 
and I think that, that you know, for me, it's been a you know a balancing act to, to be able to make sure that I have all the things that you need. And you can only wear so many hats before you get exhausted. So, mm-hmm. you know, as you go through it, it's like, like that. Listen, we're probably lucky that we had each other because what he didn't want to do at those days, listen, you know, and flip flop. If you have to do them all, it's a challenge. Yeah. You know, and to spread yourself thin, you got to have good assistance underneath you that that really can can manage that. And you believe that they. They, they're like you. They're hard on kids, but they love them, you know, and they're good to them. But, they, you know, and they'll get better when, they, when they're in their care, you know. And, and there's also the balance of having, you know, you know, we, we got to have more marketing. You got to have more socials. You got to do what you got to do. You know, you got to have more chalk talks. You got to do the things that, that, want, that people want to hear. Mm-hmm. So, but, it, but it's been a challenge, you know, just to, you can't, you know, doing them all and making sure that you get the right pieces. And when you have, you know, at the time when I was, when I was at Ohio State, when you had six guys training for the Olympics, you know, that are all really good, you know, I mean, this isn't a slight on Logan, but that when he was, when he was a freshman, he was probably the third best guy we had at the time, you know, with Sean Bunch and Reese Humphrey and, and, um, and he was really good, but he wasn't the best guy we had. So mm-hmm. we, we challenge him, you know, so having those resources, you have those, have those people in there, make it a heck of a lot easier when it comes to culture. And it also attracts all the best people. So, you know, as you saw Kyle Day going to Penn state, you know, that having another, good guy i mean i don't know how much more you would need to, to get to be attracted but it certainly helps in those those uh, uh, arenas right so yeah um, for me yeah it's it, you know you gotta gotta have gotta have your rtc running properly got you know we have the know-how here you know i've, I've been a part of a lot of things and so i, I feel just that one of the components is getting that getting enough resources so you can have you know you can have the guys that you want you know having enough you don't have to have 15 guys like Penn State, but it, you know, I think an optimal number is five. Having five guys training for the Olympics in your program is good. Yeah, uh, that's. And all of it's, you know, and all of it's related, right? Getting the to your point, getting the, a good team out there brings more fans in, and you know, a big part of that's recruiting. And and I'd love to understand for you, like, what is your template for recruiting? Like, what are you looking for in guys? Well, I think they they got to fit our our system. You know, if, if you're talking to you know people that. They got to fit in our box, right? You know, from from a work ethic standpoint, they got to fit in that box, right? From an academic standpoint, they got to fit in that box. You know, um, you know, I certainly like guys that shoot. Certainly like guys that are that are aggressive. Um, but they got to. But if you don't fit into, uh, you know, that workhorse mentality, you know, you're probably not going to like it here. If you don't, if you like to take all summer off, you're probably not going to like it here. They don't fit us. So you got to find out. And you got to ask a lot of questions. You know, I ask my staff to ask people. Ask enough questions so that you know the answers. You know, don't, don't tell me you didn't know. You know, it's because you didn't ask enough questions. Then. So, you know, and, and I think there's, you know, places that, hey, listen, sometimes you got you to get who you can get. But, but if, you know, if, if they're, if they have, you know, they believe in education, they have really strong work ethic and they have good character, that's, that's the core value that, that, that I want. And, and, and as, as you go to compete, it's like, guys, you know, you got to, if you don't like to work out, this is not a great spot for you. If you like to work out three or four days a week only, I am not your guy. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm not your guy. I mean, and I know just like I said, philosophically, you can listen to 10 interviews. I, I'd probably say, no, nah, we live a life of, of work, you know, and um, you're, you're made to do that. And if, and if you, that's not something that you're into, then just, you know, I like guys that, that want to, you know, you don't have to want to be an Olympian, but it's nice when, when, when they have the same thinking as, as you. You know, I'm probably not as good with somebody that just wants to be a part of something. I'm just not. I'm not as good at, you know, I don't understand their thinking, you know. And so the better we get and the more people that have the same, we have the same views, the easier it'll be for me to coach them up. Yeah. I mean, and when you look at it at that level, I mean, another big piece of what you're looking for, I got to imagine, is just being able to take feedback. Because I love how you said, like Logan Stever, that, you know, he didn't want it sugar-coated. He just wanted the truth. And a lot of guys sometimes can't take that hard truth. And you, you listen to, like, I love documentaries on sports, like the Bill Belichick Patriots documentaries. They all said the same thing. That guy was just brutally honest, but that's what, what it takes. Is that something you uh, kind of fits into your philosophy as well? For sure. You know, the, you know, I, I just think being authentic, and, and I think we'll get people on, on who we are. You know, we don't really have any gimmicks to tell somebody on it. If you like that, then we're probably not, you know, we're always just looking for the right fit, right? I, I don't want somebody to come if it's not the right fit. If you don't want to, you know, go to the U23s and U20s and, 
and do that stuff and go to the U.S. Open and get, you know, it's like, you know, they, they got to be the right fit, you know, and, and the elite people, they, they, they always want, they want the feedback. You'll notice along the way is your most elite people want the most feedback. Kyle Snyder wants the most feedback, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because he wants to make improvements and he does not bother him when you're hard on him and you tell him the truth. He takes that and he absorbs it and, and he and, and enjoys it. He, he, he knows he's not, he knows he's not perfect. He'll go back through and watch his world championships and he won and look at it and, and somebody will dissect it for him. Say, well, got an error here. got an error here, you know, and he likes that. Now I think mediocre people, they, they, they don't like that. That hurts their feelings. Those elite people, they love it. You know, they, they take it on the chin and they go, okay, I, they get it. Okay. I'll, I'll fix it. I'll fix that. And so, um, just depends who you're talking to and what, and what you're, you know, you know, what you're looking for, I guess. And, but, but I know the elite people always want, want the feedback. They always do. And who was that guy for you when you were competing in the, in, you know, either at Edinburgh in the eighties or on your international scene of the nineties, did you have a mentor or are you like, kind of like John Smith or he was his own coach? No, I, I think I had lots of mentors. You know, I, you know, I, Bruce Burnett and Tim Flynn and people that, you know, were always, you know, Tim Flynn, you know, what he came when I was a senior at Edinburgh and, uh, you know, um, and so that being said, you know, I, I spent a lot of time working out with him, you know, and, and dr- listen, he was a little bit older and drilling with somebody when you're at a certain age, it's not that fun getting squeezed and getting gut wrenched and laced. And it's not fun if you're an older man and you're wrestling because you want to help people. And so, you know, Tim and Bruce Burnett, and Bruce Baumgartner, you know, I, I, you could always bounce things off of. I think the person that helped me the most in skill sets was probably Bruce Burnett because, yeah. you know, he was, he just can break it down and he put time and energy into me and it was my job to, to do it, but he was the one showing it. So when you look at it that way, it's like, no, he's teaching you how to do it. He's teaching you how to trap arm gut. You know, my job is to go back and perfect it. His job is to teach it. His mm-hmm. job is not, next time he sees me, I should have something down some skill sets down. I shouldn't, you know, you know, you can't be like Dory from finding Nemo and learn something. And get it. You got to be able to apply it and use it. And so, you know, it's like, and that's, you know, that's where I got a lot of my freestyle knowledge, you know, from him um, and, and training back in those days. And I think a lot of people did back then. And you mentioned Bruce Baumgartner. Was he, so was he coaching at Edinburgh? And it, when was he the AD? I don't know that timeline. Well, he was the, um, after let's I don't know the exact timeline. It's been such a long time. We talked about this, but um, but Bruce was my coach. Mike Diana was, was started uh, and recruited me. Bruce became the coach. Tim Flynn came when I was a senior in '93. Um, okay. Bruce was still wrestling. Still, um, Bruce was on the same Olympic team in '96. So you know, I think '96, '97 was his last time. Bruce might have wrestled the World Cup that last year in Stillwater with us. Um, you know, and then after that. He became the AD and Tim was the head coach, I believe. Some, something of that nature, you know. Um, so, yeah, but Bruce is the, – the, the greatest thing about Bruce Baumgartner is just the way he lives his life. He's just – he's always been pure. He always has been. You know, he don't swear. He, You know, he did, he's a guy that doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He just – wrestling was his thing. And, um, you know, and, and I just – you can always look at that and say, listen, he lives a clean life. He does things right. His lifestyle is why he's got, you know – 14 or 16 medals you know i think he won the u.s open from for like 17 straight years 16 or 17 straight years you talk about getting a couple you know i have three u.s open plaques and i thought oh that's pretty neat you know you got three you got 17 of them you know so <laughs> it's, it's a little bit embarrassing right should have won more <laughs> and a guy like that what what i love to read about is just how consistent he was yeah you know i mean he was you know being a big guy i mean i it, and, you know, for him, he was already one of the best in the world. You know, um, you know, once he got to that platform and he won, you know, he won in, I think, 83 and then he won in 84. And, you know, and I think he might have won the, all the way up to 96, the U.S. Open and from 82 on, I think, something crazy like that, 82 or three. Um, you know, but but it's just his consistency. He's big. He, he, he liked to work out. He, he wasn't a football player. He, you know, I can tell you this. The one thing he, that's neat about him is he loves wrestling loves wrestling you know uh and like to do it you know yeah. and that, that that's always an important factor when you watch people win win at that level they just love it you can see you can see the way they compete you know so that, that that's a that's a fun um characteristic about about him when you love it like that it makes it easy to do 
and you watch remember back in those days it wasn't as meant like now all these people have these rtcs it's like there was bruce Baumgartner and myself both on the <laughs> in 96 you know and so you get to look at that you know and try to make that real right so in 96 it was an uh, exciting year yeah, let's go into that a little bit because, you know, 96, the Olympics were in Atlanta. And at your weight class, it was you and Zeke. And at the trials, Aiken upset Zeke. Um, but before we even get to the trials, tell us about kind of where are you training and where are you living leading up into the Olympic team trials in 96? Edinburgh? Yes, I, I lived in Edinburgh. And I rented an apartment. You know, when you make 800 bucks a month, that's, you know, you're not really killing it. Let's just say that. <laughs> So it, it, I think there was a little bit different, you know, just times were different. You know, the resources were different. The amount of funding was different, um, you know, and, but, but I was always grateful for the opportunity to do what, what I wanted to do, you know? So, you know, you weren't living high on the hog, but at the same time having the opportunity to go, you know, and some people ask, listen, I do it. I do it again for nothing. Just, I liked it. You know, I, I liked to tr train. I liked competing, you know, um, and, and like I said, I trained at Edinburgh. So I use the, the college guys like we do today. The RTCs are just a, a bigger, um, you know, they're just a bigger factor now in, in, in success in college programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Having those people to work out with is, is a big deal. Having elite or Olympians and world-class people to work out with guys is a big deal. And that's the quickest way to make them grow. So, you know, I work out with our college guys and, you know, um, Tim Flynn, we didn't have, you didn't have any real individual coaches. You had, you kind of coached yourself a little bit and you got some pointers from uh, Tim Flynn and the college coaches and you went to, you went to training camps to get the knowledge from Bruce Burnett, but that's kind of how that went. You know, training camps were a little more, you know, useful. You have, you'd have a January and February camp where you learn stuff and do some tours and, you know, uh, had sun kiss and had some domestic competitions. So, but, but that's kind of how that, that went. I won't say you coach yourself 100% of the time, but, but you certainly didn't have like, an RTC coach that was putting you through. Mm -hmm. And what was your daily routine like when you were living that kind of Spartan life, 800 bucks a month? Well, I mean, listen, you work out twice a day, you run, listen, when, when you're, when you're a 14, five pounder and you weigh 135 or 36 or whatever that was, might even been higher at times. <laughs> you know, I did a lot of running and a lot of wrestling. I didn't lift weights as much cause I was already big enough, you know? So I did a lot of running and wrestling, you know? And, um, but but we also got on the mats more, you know, like you'd get on the mats five days a week and probably two or three days a week in the morning too. Wow. Most people don't do that anymore. That's, that's a, that's pretty rigorous. You know, when you work out in the afternoon, five days a week in the afternoon and two or three days a week in the morning. So that was, um, that's probably the, one of the bigger differences, but that, but if you didn't know parterre back in those days, you couldn't really be successful. If you didn't know how to gut wrench or uh, lace or defend any of those things, you, you probably weren't going to be successful at, on the international scene. You could be good on your feet, give up one takedown. Guy gets the takedown, turns you five times, it's over. So, yeah, it's crazy to think back to the the rules where one point takedown, and now it's like the rules favor the college wrestler a little, the college the American wrestlers because takedowns are worth two. And you know, I, I just love the rules right now. But um, yeah, you look back to to you guys, turns were two and takedowns are worth one, so you're spending more time on the mat. Um. And that's just that's just a lot of work you put in over the years. I mean, on your own too. It's like, geez. Well, I, I think that you know, I, you know, when you're doing it for yourself, you know, all those extra workouts. I mean, it is a lot of work, but I think that at the same time, you know, I don't think I'd want it any other way. You know, it, it's for you. It's like, you know, when you're doing, when you're remember, you're training for the Olympics. It, it's about you. You know, mm -hmm. you're trying to, you know, so the time and energy you put into your training sessions and the, and the, the quantity and quality that you you do them at will make a difference and so i don't regret any of those you know the extra and, and continually do it and, because it, it gives you ownership you own you and i tell my team all the time you gotta have ownership mm -hmm. it's not just practice anybody can anybody can come to practice and <clears throat> and do the bare minimum that's not going to make you great anybody can come in and check check the box i came came today that's not going to make you great it just won't you know if you don't come with energy and attitude and enthusiasm and with, with a little plan to get better and have some purpose, it's like, well, yeah, you come all the time. You just, you're not, you're not improving. And, 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 the, and all I ask is why, why aren't you? Mm -hmm. Why you should be, if you're doing that kind of work, you should be improving. And it, and for some people that have a good wrestling IQ, they should be growing exponentially. You shouldn't have to say it more than once. 
you know? And so if you're not making progress, you just got to look at why. why you're not. So it comes down to like having a plan going into each practice on what you're going to work on that day or even that week. Well, there's always an area of concentration that, you know, there's an area of concentration for, for workout session, maybe for the week, maybe for, maybe it might be at, you know, it might be three to five weeks, you know, Hey, we're going to work on this until you get it right. You know, until it looks right. So my people, you know, the drilling and the repetition is tough, but that's how you get your, your, that brain of yours to work properly, you know, without, without thinking, you don't know thinking it just can happen. So, yeah. um, so yeah, the, I think the more ready you come for practice, the, the better your, your sessions will be. And, you know, and the more progress you'll make, if you don't come ready and you're just aimlessly or just come because you're sprinting from class, you never, you, and you ate, you rammed a sandwich in. 15 minutes before your stomach hurts. Now it's like, just, you didn't come ready <laughs> and people don't like the times you just didn't come ready. You know, it's like giving up the first takedown, takedown and got laced. It's like, you weren't ready. And I was ready. You're not ready. How do you know? He gave, got it and, and four laces to, to end the match. It's, couldn't have been that ready. <laughs> so and it happens to everybody. Nobody's perfect, you know, but, but at the same time, people don't like to, when they tell them you got to be more ready than that. You got to come more ready than that, but you practice that every day. Practice it every day. You have an opportunity every day to come to practice for, for your team and come ready. Eat well ahead of time. Make sure you're ready. Make sure you have energy. Get warmed up right. And uh, um, th those things matter over time. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I just had uh, Coach Kevin Dresser on last week, and he was saying how back in the 80s at Iowa, you would have your workout partner plan like three days in advance. And, you know, Lincoln McElravey, same thing. He said you know, he would get nervous for practice because he, that's how important it was to him. Yeah, because if you don't come ready, if you wrestle someone that's real and you don't come ready, they will kick the ever living shit out of you and, and enjoy it. You didn't come ready <laughs> and enjoy it. And they should. And I'd expect someone to want me to. If I didn't come ready, I, you, you, but that's how you learn. You learn by getting whomped sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's one of those things you get in a really good room and you don't come ready. It's like, no, no, he's. I, I took one on the chin today, you know, <laughs> but that's you look, how you learn. Yeah. I mean, uh, and you got to be able to reflect on it and see why it happened to, to get better. When you look back on your career, a lot of great guys at the lightweights back then, you know, Sammy Hansen, Zeke Jones, Jordanoff, um, you know, of those guys, who would you say was one of the guys you thought about more frequently than others and was really on your radar? Well, I think they're, you know, they're all really, great champions, you know, I mean, Jordan off and Sammy and, and, um, and Zeke, you know, and so, you know, I, I don't think I, I, there's ever one time that you go, you know, the, the one thing I think you had to do back in the day, and it's, it's probably going to be like this soon now. It's like, you got to make the team first guys. If you can get on the team, you can win the medal. <laughs> if you can get on a team, but you're going to have to go through some wars to get on it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be remember out of what you saw this weekend, there's only going to be six Olympians. So there's going to be some, some moving and shaking, right? And, and some weight classes. And there's going to be loaded. And so, um, you know, getting on the team. So I don't think it's, a, if it's any one person because, I, you know, they all have different styles. And they're all, you know, really good. So I, I never sat around and was like, I just think you have to have different tactics and strategies for each guy. And where you think they're vulnerable at the time, you know. And, and um, so there's, I don't think there's any one because they're all great. And if you don't come ready and you don't make weight right, because back in those days, you know, it's like, and it's probably like this now, but people don't cut as much. It's like, if you don't make weight right, even if you made weight, it, it showed in your performance. If you cut too much water out of you, it showed. Okay. Not moving real well, you know, struggling, struggling, made weight wrong. So there, I, I think there's lots of things, but I think when it comes to all the people you have to compete against, first you got to, you got to beat the guys domestically before we get to, to the next platform and think about Bulgaria at the time, you know, got to, got to get through Zeke and Sammy and, Abbas and Aiken and whoever else, Thomas, and whoever else was in there, you know, there's a bunch of them. So I, I, I think it was just like, Hey, you got to win the U S open first. The system was different now. Remember? Mm -hmm. um, so, but still great yeah. teams back then. I mean, you think back to the last time we won the worlds 2017, but then 93 and 95. So that's your heyday. And these are the team. Like it's, it's kind of similar to how it is now where U S you know, was, was really strong internationally. Yeah. No, we have, a, we have an incredible team right now. And those guys, you know, they're, they're all, you, you can tell that, you know, they're all bought in. They have a good wrestling IQ. They're always making progress, you know, and, um, you know, I, I, you can just tell that it looks like they're having a lot of fun and 
you know, and, uh, and competing at a really, really high level. So, um, you know, obviously the Olympics will be fun. You know, you throw Russia in there, you throw some six weight classes and it gets even more competitive. So as, as a fan and watching people do that, it's like, no, it's great. <laughs> when you're in a, when you're in a different, on a different side, the coaching side or the, you know, or the athlete side, it's like, no, adding more flavor and add more people. Let's <laughs> keep Love it. Yeah. I love how aggressive we are too. Like it's pretty clear to what you wouldn't even have to watch the singlet or the name. And you could just tell by watching a match of two, like two shadows and know which one's the American. Cause every guy is just so aggressive. Yeah. And then, you know, and like you said earlier that, you know, I think that the rules favor us now, two point takedowns, you know, and, and being able to do that, there's not much part tears. So college wrestling can jump right on the scene and be successful. You know, um, when there's forced part tear, it changes a little bit, you know, would probably change a little bit. Who's, who's our best guy, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but it, because of that, those skill sets would, would start to matter. But right now it's, you can leave college wrestling and as long as you don't expose your back, you know, get on those takedowns and you're aggressive and you got great energy. It's, it's, uh, you, you can be in the thick of it. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah. It's like, uh, like even a guy like gross, like I, you know, a lot of people weren't really sure what he, what we were going to see out of him because, you know, he's kind of, you know, the style it's, you know, a little bit more scrambled or more funk, but man, he, he pulled out a couple of little, uh, little folks style moves out there this weekend. He wrestled tough too. Um, and man, you think about the weight class consolidation that it just gives me a pit in the stomach to go from 10 to six. Um, now in your, in your era, like 95, did you have the same number of weight classes, the 96 games as there was at the 95 worlds? Yeah. Yes, there was there 10. Was. There was 10. Okay. So, and then I, a few years later, you know, I believe there was eight and then now it's down to six. Six is ridiculous. I mean, that is, it, it just angers me to even think about that. And, and when you're in your era, day before weigh-ins or day of weigh-ins? Uh, day before, day before so, weigh-ins. So you guys were cutting some weight back then. Yeah, that's why when the 35 to 40 pounders would wrestle 14 <laughs> and if you weighed 50, <laughs> something you probably wrestle 25 and a half and so you know it it, it just depends yeah you know? wow well coach it's been a lot of fun to talk i just have a couple of questions uh, a little rapid fire questions and we'll, we'll sign off here um one of the things i love hearing you talk about is some of the more like fundamental basics that you break down such as like how to make contact with a guy or if you're right leg league right leg lead which way to circle could you talk about maybe like just some of like the core fundamentals that that you think maybe are missing or are just key to your game? Well, I think one of the things that, you know, it, well, it, it, that's kind of a loaded question. You know, when you start talking about that, here's what I'd say, you know, from head position to making contact correctly to protecting your legs, you know, um, you know, as you do that, if you're, you know, and obviously there, there are people that are always going to be a, you know, right hand, right, you know, right hand, right leg and, and pop on the head and stuff. Everybody has, but, but in general, in the open, having your hands low, making sure your head's lower than your opponent, making sure that you make contact either from the wrist or from the collar. You know, there's just little things I think that as you move forward and you're putting pressure on them, you know, um, you know what that kind of looks like, you know, and, and I know everybody can defy and you know, have different things that they do, you know, so I don't want to blanket anything and say, Oh, you got to do, you know, but at the same time, head position, when you talk about that to me, I, I, I instantly think if you can <clears throat> teach one thing properly, it's, it's, it's good head position. It's good offense and defense and, you know, keeping your hands down in the open, you know, not reaching so much, you know, touching with your head first, you know, so there's just some things that, that, that I think are important, you know, before we start even rolling, you know, uh, before you even get to the point where you're, you're, you're on offense besides moving your opponent, doing, doing all those things, whether you go off the elbow or elbow pushing and posting and snapping. And so, um, but I don't know if I answered your question. But no, you did. Head, I, I, the, the number one thing I'd say, learn head position first <laughs> and then yeah. move forward. So. Yeah, no, it's like you, you have to know the fundamentals before you start breaking some of the rules. You know, like like you said, right leg lead. Yeah, you see a lot of people do re reach up with the right hand first, but, you know, it, that's, you know, it leaves you a little bit open. So you're saying fundamentals. Well, well, you might have speed too, though. You might have speed and maybe you can get away with it. Some things you can just get away with. Hey, he can do that. But if you're talking about if you're trying to teach your eight year old, you better start going baseline. You know, if, yeah. if you got got incredible gifts, things will always change when people have gifts. It's like, no, he's gifted there. He can do that. He can do that. I don't recommend it to you. You might not have that same gifts. So, you know, it's like it, it's easy to say to find someone that can defy it. it. You know, but 
they're usually gifted. They're already really successful and things. They got speed. And they got they they do some things differently. Yeah, and it, which is creative. And and when you talk about you know things you can control in a match, if you just say tempo and ties, the only thing you can control, what does that mean to you? And like, how do you distill that to your guys? You know, when you're talking about the tempo, it's just the pace of the match. You know, and you 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 should be controlling the the pace of which things are happening. You know, and 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 tying up. You know, when you, you should be in your in your control time. Where where is your control time? What is it? What does it look like? Is it off the elbows? Is it the underhook? Is it inside tie wrist? Is it collar tie wrist? Where are you gonna where can you score points? Mm-hmm. And, and and so you gotta be finding ways to get to your position. They're always finding ways to get to your position so you can score points. And and if you never get to your position, it's like, well, you never got there. Well, of course. Were you fighting for it? No. Well, what the hell? Why weren't you? <laughs> right. Should be. You know, you should be, you know, what are you out there just on defense? And so, you know, when the tempo is just the pace of the match, you know, and you, the first thing I look at is just how much energy you have out there. Does he make weight right? How much energy does he have? Can he wrestle hard for the whole time? And, it, and when you just measure energy first, forget the moves for a second, just mm-hmm. measure energy. Got no energy. Wrestles too slow. Doesn't go hard enough. You know, it's like, that's the first thing I'll look for. Just to, wow. until you get back up there. You know, how are you going to win at the national championships without having incredible energy? You know, yeah. it, it's got to have it. Watch the tournament over, over time. You get old like me, you watch, you've seen the tournament a million times. So it's a, guys, you got to have energy. The guys that are successful, they're competitive. They're out there scoring, trying to score the whole time. They're, they're getting after you from, from the start of the match. They're not trying to win at the end. So, you know, being, having that energy will matter. And and you think about having the energy when you don't want to, or when it's like late February and you know, people are you know, they they've been at it for six seven months. I'll, I got to imagine a lot of great champions are thinking about you know their competition. They're thinking about their goals. My last question for you is: Were you someone who who visualized and was big on like writing down your goals when you were a competitor? And if so, like what was your process? Well, I think you should always write them down. I think the moment you write something down, they they get a little more real, you know. I think writing it down gives you gives you the vision a little bit, you know, and having them where you can see them all the time makes it so that you you know it's like every day I'm fighting for something, you know. Do you get it's easily it's easy to get distracted in today's world for everyone mm-hmm. for the athlete for everyone. So just knowing what your purpose is and knowing what you're really fighting for, it's hard when you feel terrible, you know, after a hard training session to come back tomorrow and have another one, you know. But you got to know what you're fighting for. So I think writing them down, having them close to you, having them where you can see them. And so, you know, it's like, you know, you know, when you're miserable, you know, kind of what you're fighting for, you know, and um, and what you really want, you know. And, it, and if you really want something, it, it, it's really not that hard to, to, to get yourself motivated to go do it again, especially when you know have, have competitions. Like you said, like Sammy Henson, and Zeke, you, I knew what they were doing. I knew they, they worked hard and I knew that it was easy to get up and up and running when I felt terrible. It's easy when you feel good. Everybody, mm-hmm. when you're great, we. <laughs> it's it's when you feel terrible that you got to have that. You got to have that. You know, um, know what your what your purpose is. I love that. I love it, Coach. That's a great way, great way to wind down. I can't wait for the season, and you know, wish you nothing but the best, and really appreciate you coming on here today. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate everything. All right, Coach. Take care.